Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing. God, I just pray that uh, any distracting spirits, any, any religious spirits that would keep us from hearing the truth and your calling will be bound right now in the name of Jesus. I pray that we begin a journey together this year of something that uh, is special. And God, I thank you for that. And God, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Anybody, this the start of the year. I love the start of the new year. Love the start of the new year. It's new. I just like, I like redos. You know? I like, I like, I like redos. I like mulligans. If you're a golfer, you know what I'm talking about. Anybody, anybody here this year uh, got some goals you want to accomplish this year? So the rest of you are satisfied with mediocrity. <laughs> anybody in here got some goals you want to change and accomplish this year? Or is anybody, have a seat, anybody in here think that you have accomplished everything you want, the Lord wants you to accomplish? Anybody in here want to see the Lord, anybody in here need a miracle to happen this year? Come on. Anybody would like to see you overcome something that you ha hadn't been able to go overcome yet? Anybody? All right. Well, you know, I, you know, one of the things, back, back in the day, it's a shame that I'm old enough to be able to say that. I've been, first of all, I've been married 29 years today. I have had to put up with Amy for 29 years. Y'all need to pray for me. She, boy, she's so blessed. Man, it's amazing. Uh, I was thinking about that. I mean, what a blessed woman she is. Have 12, 12 men adoring her, man. She'd run through a brick wall to get to us. Well, I got some, go, you know, 29 years. I'm, I'm old enough. Back, you know, back in my 20s and 30s, I was a pretty good golfer. So I have a, I have a goal this year. I'm going to try to get back into golf. I want to play better than what I've been playing. So I just thought I'd practice today. So, you know, I used to can hit this thing exactly where I want to hit it. You know, I'm going to see if I, you know what's here, you know, look at that. <laughs> Aren't you glad that's a ping pong ball? You know, one of the things I love about golf, and the Lees taught me this, Tracy and Russell and all them, is this little word called mulligans. If you, if you know what God, mulligan is, a mulligan is when you hit a bad shot and you don't like it and you hit it into the water, you just take another ball and you drop it out and say, no, that one don't count. I get a mulligan. I get a redo. And so then with great, with great joy and promise, you drop that new golf ball down because you just hit the one in the water, you drop that golf ball down, and you put the exact same swing on it, and the results say just the same. The exact same swing, and you get madder the second time. I watched a member of our church, God love him, one of my dear friends, Hit the ball in the water seven times in a row. <laughs> Kept telling him, said, son, why don't you change, aim somewhere different, do something different. Hush up, I got this. 
became so enraged at the seventh Titleist V1 going in the water, then threw his club into the water, into the lake. I said, man, this is about a $150 hole for you right here. There's no sense in having any good expectations if you're not going to change your swing. Oh, I'm going to. Many times. Some of you have so many wants, expectations, so many desires, and most of them are good, but you are totally unwilling to change. I have a word for you today. That's asinine. Look it up in the dictionary. If you're not willing to change, do not expect different results. If you're not willing, and here's the thing, I'm not talking about changing your thoughts based on what you think you should do or what Dr. Phil, I'm talking about God's thoughts. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Because when you do that, I got one more in my pocket, so I thought I'd hit another one. I'm going to hit it back there. Oh. I'm going to hit it a different way. Yeah, I'm not going to scare her. <laughs> Coach, I'm going to try to hit it back there to you. Uh, you think you can catch it? See, I'm going to put a different swing on it this time. I'm going to hit it harder. It might go straight. Y'all, I'd watch out if I was y'all. Oh, he caught two. <laughs> now, one of the things, today I want to start, and I, I just got one point, but I'm going to hit it so hard that if you will smile and go with me, we'll get out of here in a hurry. Because I don't want to jump in too deep to this pond today. Because I want you to understand, God wants to take you on a journey all right? You did not, <laughs> this is even funny saying it. Everything about you didn't get fixed when you got saved. I know you. You still, I mean, and the ones of you that don't think you need to change, uh, oh my God. <laughs> what planet do you live on? Do you understand that God, that God gives us. See, even so, here's a couple of things the Lord, some thoughts the Lord gave. Like some of you, your parents were complete failures. And you said, I'm never going to be like that. Well, you are going to be just like that. Or you're going to be the total opposite, which is just as bad. See, God gives us a chance. He is the only one that can give mulligans. He's the only one that can change our swing. He's the only one that can turn us into a new person. But it's got to be through his way and his process. And I want to take you on a journey today. Today We want to start a journey. And uh, the journey to wholeness. And I want you to take some notes today because I want to give you a couple things. I want you to write them down. And we're going we're gonna to talk about the journey to wholeness. And listen to me. If you're going to follow Christ, you've got to be willing to change. Amen. I'm going to say that again. If you're going to follow Christ, you're going to have to be willing to change. Or, or, or you're perfect. And if you are, then come on up here. May have, far be it from me. You teach us from your infinite knowledge of perfection. So if I'm not perfect, if, I'm not, if I have not reached 
all that God has for me, then what does that mean? Pray tell. It means I got to make some alterations. I got to be willing to, to, to change some things. I got to change my swing. Does that make sense? And so this journey to wholeness, we're going to start today and we're just going to begin. We're going to take one step today. But it is a step that you cannot bypass because if you do not, if you bypass this one, none of the rest of it will work. And so that's why I'm taking time. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians. Put 523 back up there. Here's what it says. Now may the God of peace himself Who ain't a whole lot of this around, is there? A lot of freaking out going on. A lot of worry. You know, when you, have, when you have peace, that means you have the absence of worry. That God. When you're, you got a prodigal or your children are going through something or maybe walking where you don't want them to walk, and yet you have peace because you know God's in there and they coming back. Wow. That God. <laughs> you know, God is not worried about who gets elected president. He ain't. He's not scared of Hillary or Donald. Or any of the rest of them. Why? Why? Because he is the God of peace. He's been to the future. He himself has a goal for you. Look what it tells us that goal is. Look what the verse is. He has a goal to sanctify you completely. We'll figure out what that word sanctify means. In other places in the Bible, sanctification, a big church word. I'm going to teach you what it is. That he may, and you may be whole. Look what he's saying now. He's giving you, you want to know what God's will for your life is? God's will for your life is to sanctify you completely and that you may be whole, spirit, soul, and body. Until Jesus Christ comes. Now, that's a pretty good goal. Everybody in here, if you're saved, that's his goal for you. That's what he wants to see happen in your life. That's what he's doing in your life. That's what he, where he wants to take you. He's a, he's a one goal oriented God in a, in a multiplicity world and he's steadily on it and he ain't shook, he ain't worried, he ain't all those things. He is the God of peace. Everybody say the God of peace. God of peace. He wants you to have peace. In the midst of your trials, you can have peace. Because why? He is the God of peace. He knows that Satan has lost every time. Every time he rears his head, it's just so God sh shoving him, making him stick his head off so he can chop it off again. He's the God of peace. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? Write this down. What does that mean to you if he's the God of peace? If you're on a journey, first of all, you don't strive on this journey. You just agree. You ever notice your kids? I've had some, some experience with taking vacations with large numbers. And... Uh, Every time my kids don't trouble themselves, I've never had my 10-year-old say, Dad, did you put gas in the car? I've never had them say, 
Now, Dad, I've checked the my route, and we might want to go around this road here. Dad, would you like me to drive? You look tired. Now, what do they do? We go into Disney World. Woo! Let's go. And so they grab their little gadgets, and they load up and say, come on. Daddy, let's go. They ain't worried about it. They're all they're doing. They're not striving over the details. They're not striving how they're going to get there. They certainly aren't striving how they're going to pay for it. <laughs> I mean, I got my kids now. They got jobs of their own that they start calling me at lunch. I mean, they're teenagers on their own job. Where are you eating lunch, Dad? <laughs> they're not striving about it. All they're doing is what? They are agreeing, we are going, dad said it, we're going to Disney World. And so all they did is just load up. Some of you are striving way too much about your future. You just need to load up and agree with it. God's already got the end set. You don't worry you just believe. You don't worry, you just believe. When he's the God of peace, you don't worry, you just believe. The last one, when you're following God, you don't settle. You don't settle. When we go into Disney World, I don't want... Uh, what was that play? My mind went blank. You know, the goofy little place out here used to, uh, no, right here, the camper place that had a little Yogi Bear. That's it. Well, Yogi Bear's good enough, Dad. It's all right. We don't mind. Disney World, you know, was great. Would have been great, but we'll settle for Yogi Bear. No, you don't. Look at me. So many of you Christians are settling for what God has in your life. You're settling way less than. You're living too worried, too striving, too much, too much pain, all those things because you're trying to make decisions that God's already made for you. We're going to learn next week about agreement. The power of grace. I'm going to teach some of you people that never learn. I'm going to teach you the proper way to double team block a defensive lineman. We're going to learn it right here on this stage next week. Don't miss it. Because I'm going to show you what some of you are doing. You are working against God. Instead of working with him, you're working against him. You're not in agreement with where he wants to take you. And when that happens, the journey is stalled. And when there's no peace, there's not a lot of peace in people's heart, is because they're fighting against God and where he's going. And I'm going to show you that next week. But I want you to understand something. And, I, and I'm going to get you happy here. That verse 24, the verse after this one says, faithful is our God. In other words, what he starts, he finishes. He's faithful. He's faithful. Now, look at, the, look at these words here. Complete, complete, sanctify you completely. That word, write this down so you'll understand. That word in the Greek means to be set apart. To be made holy. To be set apart. Christians should be healthier than non-Christians. Mentally, physically, everything. We should be set apart. Our lifestyle should be set apart. Not the same. God's going to sanctify us. His goal for us is to be sanctified. His goal for us is to be made whole. That's where he's taking us. Now, let me give you a visual. Let me show you this, and we're going to have this several times, but I want to start here today and then uh, get into our one step. 
put our uh, deal up. Before the fall, before the fall, the Spirit was in charge. This is before sin sin entered. The Spirit dominated the soul, which is your mind, your thoughts, your thought patterns, your will, and your emotions. Emotions are not evil if they're dominated by the Spirit of God. Emotions can be horrible if they're not dominated by the Spirit of God. Woo! And then your body manifests the two. Your flesh, your desires, your instinct. You're in, that's when you're run by instinct. That's a, you can, we're going to learn all about this. So you, you know, we're going to delve way into this more than I, I'm going to get up inside your head really bad and crack it open and hopefully you won't find scary things. But your body, your instinct, there are a lot of people, that's where if it feels good to you, you do it. That's coming from your body. Because Why? When sin entered the world, what, was the, what did the word of God say? When sin entered the world, he said you would die, correct? Well, did they physically die? No. What happened was, it flipped over after the fall, your body, people begin to live by instinct. Your soul and your will and your emotions, your spirit was dead. And so your mind began to thought. Can I, can I just throw a few things out like this? Can I just say this? There's a lot of people that are living just like that. They sleep with whoever they want to. See somebody that turns them on, try to sleep with them. That's animalistic. That's instinct. Man is above animals. We're supposed to be better than that. Just because it feels good to it doesn't mean that we do it. We are the ones that have self-control in, in all the things that God has given us. Look at this right here. If you are in this room and you are not saved... This is your condition right here. You are spiritually dead. It doesn't matter if you're a good person. Oh, well, Brother Allen, he's a good person. It doesn't matter. My spirit is what lives forever. If it's dead, you're dead. You're not going to heaven. You cannot reach sanctification. You can't make yourself better. There's not enough willpower in your body to make yourself better. What you will do is, you'll trade one set of chains for another. You might get set free of one thing, but you didn't really get set free. You just traded chains. You know, people that stop smoking, but then they eat themselves into early grade. People that stop this, but then they start doing this. This right here is the condition of man since the fall. You know how I know this? Here, let me just prove my point real quick, scientifically. Anybody ever had to teach a kid to lie? Yeah. Anybody, anybody? See, this is the selfish mindset because the body is innately selfish, the flesh. Anybody ever had to teach a kid to be selfish? They come ready-made, don't they? Ready-made to be selfish. Ready-made. They go, it's that fallen spirit, that, that spirit that is dead. Now, when I give my heart to Jesus Christ, when I get saved, what does it say? You are born again. It goes back, go back to the other one. Now my spirit man is saved. But I've got to retrain because my spirit, my mind, my will, and my emotions are programmable. 
I've got to reprogram my thought processes. Some of you were trained by the way you were brought up. You're, you're repeating the same mind traps. All these things. And so God wants to sanctify us wholly, completely. Everybody say completely. Spirit, soul, and body. He wants to sanctify our minds, our emotions to be under his control. He wants to do all that. He wants to, to make us into the image of his son where we respond and we are a trophy of his grace. Where we are like the apostle Paul was a murderer. He killed, he thought it was good, a good job to kill men, women, and children. I mean, killed them, stoned them to death. And the Lord so transformed him and reprogrammed him that he became the, the major author of the Bible. Became a trophy of God. A, he became sanctified, set apart, not only in his calling, in his spirit, but he became that way in his mind. I'm telling you, some of you are struggling with your mental capacity. And I'm telling you, when you start releasing into the spirit, God will, will straighten that up. And he'll not only straighten it up, he'll take you further than you ever dreamed, dreamed possible. He'll give you ideas that you couldn't get before. Your emotions will begin to be reined in by the Spirit. And then your body, your body will begin to respond. Let me tell you something. One of the things I want to say to you, and we're going to look through the Apostle Paul, this whole journey. This is a journey to wholeness. Man, I, don't you want your marriage to be better? I mean, is, is it good as it can get? Well, then that means I've got to change my thinking pattern. I've got to change my emotions. I've got to change my way of doing things. How many of you want your children to be better than you are? To do better than you are? Your grandchildren? Well, then you need to alter your way of thinking. You can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. And so this year, I want you to be further along on your journey toward wholeness. Does that make sense? Now, there's one, one point that you got to get. And everybody with your pen, have it ready. And I want you to write this down because this is important. This is huge. Well, let me just say it like this. <laughs> Man, I remember my mind was small and they wouldn't be quiet. And I'd look, I'd kill you. They just... Everybody look at me. Hey, man, that shouldn't bother you. You've been with family all week. That's, that's quiet compared to my family. Look at me. Everybody listen to me. If you do not get this first step, you are not going to get any of the rest of the time. Whatever I talk about, ever how good we make it, how much fun we make, and we're going to have fun, we're going to have skits, we're going to do stuff, but I'm telling you, if you do not understand and realize and, and grab hold of and, and decide this is right, the next step, you, the first step, then it's all for naught. All right? You're just going through the motions of coming to church because God wants to take you somewhere. God does not want to leave you where you are. Did you hear what I just said? God has a better plan. This is not it. This is not all God has for me to offer me. Are you listening to me? This is not it. There is more. I have not experienced all God wants me to experience. I haven't done everything he wants me to do. This is not it. And if you settle where you are, you'll always be where you are until eventually you'll go backwards. Because you'll look for something new. First step on the journey. Put that logo up there, uh, Lance. That looked cool. Doesn't that look cool? That kind of looks like me, doesn't it? 
I looked at the end, it could be me. The first step to the journey to wholeness is agreement. Agreement. Write that word down. I've got to come into agreement with who God says I am right now. Put the last one after saved up there. Let me tell you what was happening. That spirit man, everything it says in the Bible that I am, that spirit man already is. <laughs> I love the look on religious people when they give me that look like, do what? Let me tell you something. I am all, I'm already going to live forever. Because when I got saved when I was sick, my spirit man, I'm already living forever in heaven. In fact, let me just go another step further. I'm already seated with him in heaven with places. I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I, that's who I am right now. That's who that spirit man is right now. That's who I am. I am. He says he'll never leave me or forsake me. I'm loved beyond belief. I am fully and totally loved. I mean, don't mess with me, man. It's working for me. Some of you want to be poor and quasi-modo in your spirit. If you want to be like that, that's fine. But I'm telling you, God has already saved me. I am saved. I am being saved, and I will be saved. I've already got a place at the table. See, you know why I'm at peace? I mean, I'm ready. Man, some of you watch the news. Oh, Brother Allen, they going to kill it. they coming. Oh. Hey, man, I don't care. You know why? This ain't my home. First of all, second of all, and if this is your home, when God comes back, you can have my house. I ain't making no more payments on it. But listen, man, it's already set. It's already set on it. I got a ticket. Look, you ever been someplace and it's crowded and you want to get that front row and you're all nervous? Come on, Amy, get dressed. Come on. We got to get there. I want to be on the front row. I remember the last time we played the PRC, South, South Mississippi State Championship. I mean, man, we, we were playing and, and, and back when the boys were still playing and, and I had... I had snuck in there. Did I, did I, is that right? I snuck in the stadium. And I laid out two big blankets that had Hickman on them. <laughs> and so I'm sitting out there grilling. I'm relaxed. I'm at peace. I'm grilling. I'm, I'm eating. I'm drinking. Hey, how y'all doing? Everybody, oh, but I, I got to go get a seat, man. Everybody's freaking out. You know, but, huh? I got to get a seat, man. I don't know what's going to happen. I might not be able to get a seat. I don't know. I might have to sit next to someone I don't want to sit next to. I don't know what's going to happen. Huh? And the whole time, I'm just I'm eating chips and dip. The barbecue, I'm grilling, you know, all that stuff. Why? Because I already had a seat with my name on it. God, there ain't no tattoo removal in heaven. God's got my name tattooed on his hand. That's already happened. It's who I am. I am a blood-bought son of the Most High God. That is who I am. That is what I am right now, today. I don't have to wait till I die. I am a child of God who is called by his name. He loves me. He is for me. He's my dad. I can call him dad. It's who I am. It's what I am right now. My spirit man can say all that and it'd be true. Why? 
Because, listen, some of you are stating man's truth. That truth ain't going to set you free, baby. It's the truth of God that sets me free from all the junk that I see. From who I once was. Now he states that. And when I come into agreement with that, from that point, he starts affecting my thinking. Starts affecting my emotions. I don't have to get on Facebook no more. They talk bad about me. Come on, let's talk bad about them. I don't have to do that no more. Why? Because my daddy's got my back. Hey, man. Have it. It's fine. Whatever. My dad's got my back. That He is my dad. I don't know about you, but I remember. <laughs> you know. It begins to affect my body. All right? Listen, my body, and I know we got a lot of worker outers in here and CrossFitters and all that. That's good, man. I, I'm, I'm going to get there one day. I ain't jumping off in boxes, so that hurts, man. I ain't doing that. But one of the things is you got to understand is, see, God doesn't want us all to look the same. You know how I know? Because Psalms 139 says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He put big gene in me. I was 11 pounds when I was born. I don't know a day of thinness. Now, I want to be healthy in my body. I want to honor God with my temple and all that stuff. I understand, but I ain't known a day. In, in, I mean, 28 was like third grade for me. My dad's favorite verse was, all the fat belongs to the Lord. Remember that? Yeah, it's just so funny. But it starts affecting your thinking. It starts affecting the way you make decisions when you come into agreement. And look, everybody look at me now, and I'm serious. None of the rest of the next few weeks is going to mean anything if you argue with what I'm saying right now. If you don't take the first step... None of the rest of it matters if you can't agree with already what God has already done, then how are you going to agree with him doing anything else? I mean, I use this on my children, child raising. Then when they screw up, I mean, they screw up sometimes. They, their mother's still in them. I'm driving it out of them. But I mean, they mess up sometimes and I say, man, that's not who you are. Do you understand that? That's what godly conviction is. It's God coming to his children saying, that's not who you are. That's not who we are as Christians. I remember one time, yeah, I think it was my brother talked me into it, but I'm sure it was him. It couldn't have come from me. This guy got a new booger light. Booger lights were a big thing back then, you know. If y'all remember booger lights, you get to, see, some of you young people going, what's a booger light, man? Well, he, anyway, well, I got a new BB gun, man. I was trying to shoot that booger light out. I didn't realize it had that hard plastic cover. I hit, and it falls down. All right, so my emotions, driven by bad ideas, I got mad, and I said, I'll show that light. I got right up under it. Shot the bulb. Of course, my neighbor was paying for it. And monthly, he was paying for the booger light that was now shot out by his neighbor. I remember sitting there. Because once I shot it, you know, you ever notice that when you have a bad idea, you have that revelation right after the fact? <laughs> this is a bad idea. This is, <laughs> you know, I've had some good ideas, but this one's bad. And you know, it's always just a few minutes too late, isn't it? And so I remember sitting at the table, eating dinner. And the guy across the street called. And uh, he, was not, he was not a Christian man. Not at all. 
I mean, there was, there was no doubt he was not a Christian man, you know, I mean, just the way he lived, his, he hollered and cussed at his wife, and, you know. and so he starts ho- hollering at me to my dad, and I'm dead wrong. I am dead wrong. And I remember my dad standing up, and I'm thinking, I am fixing to get killed right here. Because my dad, he he was one of those, he didn't whoop you for everything, but if he got up and got his belt, he was going to whoop you that you never wanted to do that again, ever. He stood up, and I'm thinking, oh, here you go. I started talking to Mama, Mama, I love you. (laughs) I'll never forget it, man. My dad stood up and said, Whoa! Let me tell you something called man by name. That's my son you're talking about. And let me tell you something else. I know he did wrong, and he'll be happy to pay for it, but I tell you one thing, if I ever hear you talking to him like that, I tell you something else, why don't you step across the street right now? You'll walk over here, but you'll limp back. <laughs> and man, my dad was going off on this guy, and I mean, I stood up behind him. I was there, he wasn't looking at me. I was like, that's right, yeah. Don't mess with me, yeah. This is what I'm saying. Even when I'm dead wrong, he's my dad. Man, why can't we agree with that? Why do we got to, why can't we just agree with what the Lord says? What he's already done. When I was born into the family, he is a proud father. I already have a seat at the table. I don't have to be anxious about the future because my dad's already been to the future and he's for me. Yeah, I've got to walk through problems. I've got to walk through issues. Yeah, sometimes life isn't the way I would choose. But every storm, he is there with me. And if you cannot agree with that, you're never going to go on a journey with the Lord. If you can't agree with the starting point, I'm I'm here because I belong to be here by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not my own doing. I was born when I said yes to him. Can we not just agree about that? And when we can agree... This is who I am. But see, some of you can't resist the devil. You can't resist the devil at all because you're agreeing with him. Uh, Nobody loves me. I can't. I'm not this. Uh, It'll never work out. Oh, you just watch. I hear this all the time. You just wait. Something bad's going to happen. Wow. 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 If you can't even agree with what God's already done, how's he going to do something else for you? How can you even possibly, we just prayed for healing. How could you even possibly think God will hear your prayers if you don't even believe he's for you? And that you belong, have a right to hear him. Now listen, I know, just like I do with my kids and my dad did with me, man, I'm telling you. A good, a good father, he ain't going to let you screw up. He'll correct you. He'll get you. God, look, God can get your attention when he wants to. But let me say something to you. It never changes the fact of what I come into agreement with. You can't resist the devil. Look, some of you think your marriage will never get any better, so you're not willing to change, and you're just agreeing with it. Wow. You know, one of the reasons I think this city's not blessed? Mm -hmm. 
I'm serious as a heart attack. You know, one of the reasons I think the city is not as blessed, I think God wants to do something book worthy here. Because Christians are constantly agreeing with what de the devil says about it. The Bible says, by the mouth of the righteous, a city is exalted. And we turn around and agree with what de Satan's got a plan for this place too. Satan's got a plan for your kid. Satan's got a plan for your marriage, just like God does. And it's who you agree with. And I've asked you this month, this year, there's two things, and this will help you agree. But if you're not willing to do these two things, wow. I've asked you to, whoever's at your house, to read the Bible out loud. If you've got small children, get a picture Bible. Small children don't need to read the King James. Can I just unload your religious demon off of you and just read a picture Bible? Read something that stirs. Tell us the story of Samuel again, Daddy. Read to us the story of David again, Daddy. Stirring their heart. I've asked you to do that three times, and I've asked you to read through the Bible this year. What does that do? It shows God... I'm willing to change my normal mode of operation. And I want to pour your thoughts, start downloading your thoughts into me. Because some of you don't even know what God said about you. You've listened to preachers tell you you're going to hell too long or your grandmother or whatever that was mean. And so you decide that's the way it is. Listen, if you're saved, God wants the best for you. He's even got a future and a plan for your life. All right? But before you do anything, you've got to agree with it. I'm going to stop right there because I felt real strong this morning. The Lord reminded me of an article that I read and it talked about falling into unbelief. And I felt like the Lord is very upset about some of us complaining and murmuring. Complaining and murmuring. See, I'm talking to you about releasing, coming into agreement with who God says you are who God says you are, and you, come, and you let it out of your mouth. Complaining and murmuring is a vote of no confidence to a God that's running your life. Did you hear what I just said? Amen. You are voting, God, I don't like the way you're running things when you complain and murmur. Some of you are keeping the blessings of the Lord you are keeping, I want you to hear this, man. This was, this was not in my sermon, okay? This wasn't where I was heading, but it was so strong this morning. Some of you are keeping the blessing of a, of a new job from you because you're griping and complaining about the job you have. That was so clear in my spirit this morning. That's the way murmuring and complaining, the promised land was right there. God didn't get all the people off. They, he wanted them to do some things, and they didn't like it. And so it cost them their promised land, and it is costing some of you your promised land because of your murmuring and complaining. And you are coming into agreement with Satan. There is a, a power of agreement. You complain about this, you complain about that. You're coming into agreement with Satan, and thus Satan is dominating your life. I'm talking about Christians. 
I'm not talking about non-Christians. We complain about this. We complain about that. We this and that. We murmur and we gripe and all. Oh, look at it. We complain about the government. Listen, if you're looking to the government to, to save you or change your life, what? Man, you need help. Do you understand? The government cannot do what only God can do. He is the only source of peace and life and future and hope. And complaining will stop you from doing that. It'll steal. It'll, listen, my victory is sealed. Griping and complaining will snatch, vic snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. And it's time for the church to stop agreeing with Satan and start agreeing with the Lord. First about ourselves. You know how they talk about, I want to just say this and then we're going to pray. They talk about self-esteem. And you know how they give all these programs, they're trying to make people feel good about themselves. And everybody's offended over words. <laughs> everybody's offended, you can't say this word, can't say, oh, that offends somebody. Oh, you know why that is? Because they're trying to get something that only comes from the Lord. You can't get self-esteem. You can't do it. When the Lord speaks to you, this is who you are. This is what you are. You're a child of mine. I mean, I don't care what you say about it. It ain't going to change my world. It ain't going to affect me one bit because I got somebody higher than you that's giving me my self-esteem. And some of you are so insecure, it's because you're listening to what everybody else is saying instead of agreeing what God is saying. This is, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And we're, I said this a couple of weeks ago, and we're propagating it. We're telling our teenagers, dress like this. Hey, you need to go have plastic surgery. You need to go be altered. Because you're, by yourself, you're not good enough. Wow. Wow. Instead of saying, you, baby, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Man, God is in love with you just like you are. Is that not the truth? Amen. The truth sets you free, don't no?